Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. Please listen carefully, for this is the word of God. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you. As with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this, is the word of God. So it's a time of Christmas, and we're starting a new series. Um, we're calling it Advent 2018. And um, for those of you who, don't, who aren't familiar with this vocabulary, Advent it simply means coming. And it's the language that Christians have used throughout the years um, to represent the coming of the Lord. We're looking toward the coming of the Lord. And it's usually at this time of season, and they use it in, to mean both the coming of the Lord his first time, Christmas, and the coming of the Lord when he returns again to consummate all the earth and the heavens and make all things new. And so, you know, we look at forward to it in both ways. Um, so as we look, you know, look toward this, uh, I want, you know, want to go into this season as we start thinking about Christmas messages. I'm not going to give all these messages. I've asked some of the other pastors to, to jump in here. And, but I, I, I want to give this first message about um, about coming and for me this message that I've entitled Christmas in the darkness I always think about this passage um, when I think about Advent I think about this passage and it's a very famous prophecy from the book of Isaiah um, the scholars call these messianic prophecies and it was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Galilee um, of Judea of Judea in in in, um, in, the, in that area, you know, in, the, in, in that Palestine area during the Roman Empire. But before the Romans conquered the world, <laughs> before even the Greeks kind of ran the world, um, this was written hundreds of years before. It's an amazing thing. And yet, though it was written hundreds of years even before Jesus was born, when I read these words, I just see our city. <laughs> I see us. And I see... It says, it starts right here that says that the people have walked in darkness and they, those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, deep darkness. And when I think about this city, um, one of the richest, um, may, maybe the richest, maybe the richest in all of America, um, it doesn't look like it's a place of darkness, does it? Um, and, but especially as we get to this time of Christmas, um, so many people are thinking about gifts and lights and celebration and happiness, and I'm going to get together with my family, but have you ever thought about um, the people who don't have family? Where are they going to go? What if they're so lonely, they, they, don't, they don't even just have somebody to give them a gift, they don't even know, have anybody to give a gift to. Have you ever thought about that? And there's so many people like that. And they're all throughout our city. And, um, and what would it be like? So just, just stop for a moment. Um, and I want to ask this question before I get into this message. Have you ever been to another country where they don't celebrate Christmas? you ever been to another country? I, I've, I've never been to another country where they don't celebrate Christmas. But it's just kind of like unfathomable to me <laughs> that we have Thanksgiving or you get to November and you get to December and there's no Christmas. Can you imagine? Um, can you imagine if there was no Christmas at this time of year? 
There's no lights. There's no celebratory music. I'm not even talking about Jesus. <laughs> All right? Even the secular version of Christmas that happens in America is a beautiful thing. Right? Even the Santa Claus stuff, give gifts to kids, and like, um, I grew up watching uh, you know, Rudolph, you know, the, the claymation little animation thing with Rudolph and Santa Claus is coming to town. And then there was a cartoon of Frosty the Snowman. I loved all those. I, and like whenever, as soon as we hit December, I couldn't wait to watch those programs. I loved the music. I couldn't wait to, uh, that our whole family would gather together. And it wasn't just that I would get a lot of cool toys and, and sometimes some really lame clothes, right? <laughs> It's like a sweater, that's okay. I guess I have to say thank you for the sweater. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, a board game is totally cool. You know, a video game, even better, right? And that's what Christmas was like. But even just, and then as I grew older and I started becoming less materialistic, um, you know, it wasn't just about what I was going to receive. What, what our families would gather together, and my cousins were really little kids at the time, and then watching them receive gifts and watching them go crazy and everybody in the whole room, all my aunts and uncles, we would laugh like crazy. It was so fun. It was so cool. Right? And you, know, you don't have to be a, Christ, uh, um, you know, a Christian to celebrate a time like that. That's just the normal thing in America. right? Um, if you live in America, that's the normal way we celebrate Christmas. But can you imagine if that didn't exist? Just, it just didn't happen. And so I want to ask you this question. If there's no Christmas, doesn't that just make everything so terrible? <laughs> just think about that for a moment. It wouldn't just make December terrible. It would make January, February. It would make the whole year. Some people look forward to Christmas all year long. You know that? Um, when I first came to America, they, we, we, you know, I found out, you know, I went to school, I, don't, I barely speak English, and I found out that they have this holiday called Valentine's Day, and you're supposed to bring these little strange pieces of paper that have like hearts on it, and, and then write down the names of every other kid in class, say, here's a Valentine for you, because like I care about you. Of course, I, I didn't care about any of these kids, but I'm supposed to pretend. <laughs> and, and of course, I didn't care, and they all gave me one, which I thought was really weird. You know, like, so I'm from Korea. I was like, what is this? You know, like some boy gave me a heart. That's strange, okay? Okay. <laughs> And, you know, like, I, I lived in a neighborhood that was, like, you know, mostly black. So, like, everybody's black. There's me and, like, one white kid and one Chinese kid, okay? And we're all giving each other little hearts. You're my friend, be, you know. And, of course, there was, like, one pretty girl, or at least the girl that I thought was the prettiest. And that's the only one I cared about, by the way. <laughs> so these are, these are odd holidays. But that was a cool holiday. And then, and then in October rolled around. And um, my aunt, she's only seven years older than me. She says, we, we put on some of this co costume. I was like, OK, whatever. And then you go to the neighbor, and you knock on their door, and you say these words, which I didn't know. Remember, I don't speak English. Trick or treat, what does that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> you say those three words, and they give you candy. I thought it was magic. <laughs> I was like, for free? <laughs> And this happens every year? Are you kidding? <laughs> I, was, I just thought, I, I thought it was like we, we came to like a magical land, <laughs> all right? Because we didn't do this in, in Korea. All right? that, that was like, and then there was Christmas. And I knew it had something to do with God. I knew it had something to do with God. But, um, you know, the God part was kind of muted. The Santa Claus and the music and the family and the gifts, it was amazing. It's just amazing. Okay. And what if it was gone? None of it happened. Okay. Part one. Do you see the darkness? <laughs> Do you see the darkness? Part two. The rod of the oppressor. That's what it says in the verse. That there's going to be this special child, a son. Somehow he's going to be a wonderful counselor and a prince of peace. 
and he's going to break a rod of the oppressor. Okay? So there's a rod of the oppressor. And I want to close by talking about the lowly yet wonderful Prince of Shalom. Right? Peace is, that's a nice word. But the real word in the Bible is shalom. And it's an awesome word. Right? It's the Prince of Shalom. So let's start off with this. Um, do you see the darkness? Verse 2. Let's start. So you guys know this famous part. Um, Unto us a child, or I hope you know it, but maybe you don't know it. And if you don't know it, that's fine. Um, Unto us a child, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Maybe you've given, you've sent people with Christmas cards and that verse is out there, right? That's a super famous verse. But the, the passage, it's a piece of like poetry actually in, in Hebrew. And verse 2 starts the poetry and it says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, not a little darkness, deep darkness, on them has light shone. That's the beginning. Um, I want to ask you, uh, do you see the darkness? We live in a, I think, okay, I don't know. I, I like the big buildings. Um, I, you know, the, the, I recently saw the movie um, uh, Crazy Rich Asians, and they fly to uh, Singapore, and I was like, that's a cool city. <laughs> and when I go to New York or Chicago, I go, that's a cool city. But you know what? Our city's not cool in terms of the big buildings, but it's a cool city, right? Um, we got way better weather than them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really beautiful around here. You can go to one of the finest ski places in the whole world in less than four hours from here. And you can go, do you know people around the country think that Half Moon Bay is a glorious place to go? Carmel is a glorious place to go. Uh, I lived in Philadelphia, and then after I moved back here, I, I noticed that the, the clouds roll over the hills right behind in our valley. And I was like, that's amazing. And it's got perfect weather and a lot of smart people and cre insane, insane amounts of money here and just insane amounts of money here, right? And yet, do you see the darkness? You see it? Um, I'm going to, I'd like to read to you from an article I read this week. It's called uh, The Chimera of American Prosperity. And it was written, I, I don't, do you have any of you read The, the Week? I, I, don't, I don't read The Week. Um, but I, it, it kind of, it came up on my Apple News feed, <laughs> of all things. And it said, The Chimera of American Prosperity. I don't even know the author's name is um, Matthew Walter. Um, I Googled him. And judging from some of the other places he writes for, I, th I think he's Catholic. Right? I think he's Catholic. But this is how it starts. If you are the sort of person who needs a center for disease control and prevention to inform you that Americans are miserable, it's now official. According to the nation's top public health agency, the rate at which we are killing ourselves is higher than has been in half a century. More than 50 years, now this is the highest suicide rate in more than 50 years. 50 years of relentless technological advances, social liberalization, optimization, and GDP growth, five decades that brought about the end of the Soviet communism and the birth of a global new order, and based on free trade and open communication, an infinite array of goods and services. So here, I'll, let's use this. I got one of these this week. You guys, you guys see this? This is it. I mean, like, this didn't exist 50 years ago. All right, this didn't exist 50 years ago. Let me tell you, this thing is darn cool. And it's red. Okay, that, that's why I got it, okay? <laughs> right? And they, they didn't, you know, like, Apple didn't even have a red one, like, a couple months ago. Right? And yet, highest suicide rate in 50 years. What, what is that? You know, you can have the money. Oh, gosh, people have lots of money. 
around here, people have insane amounts of money. Your neighbor has a house that's worth a million dollars or two million dollars. Right? They may not make a house. They may not make enough money to afford that house, but that's completely normal, normal in this city. He goes on. Um, you would have to be breathing pretty rarefied air not to have noticed the quiet despair. That's the word he uses. Despair so many people are feeling. Just look at the other numbers. Rates of drug overdose are going up. <laughs> A trend to which voters have responded. So this is, I, I think he's being, I don't think he's too happy about this. So there's drug Overdose is going up. So the way we decided to do it is let's legalize more drugs, marijuana. I don't think he was too happy about that decision. Right. Teenagers, especially girls, are mutilating their bodies with glass and knives with unspeakable regularity. We have some teenagers in this room. You don't have to answer or nod your head. Do you know anybody who's doing this? I sure hope it's not you. In, um, in 1991, I, I, I spent the summer out in Yosemite National Park in doing this thing called Christian Ministry in the National Park. And um, the, the girl who was assigned to me to be you know, the, the, my partner to, to, to um, evangelize this one particular part of the National Park, she was, from, she, was a, she, was a, she was a pretty white girl from Pennsylvania. And the first night when we were hanging out, so you know, we just meet each other, she, she, the first time I met her, first time I met her, she told me she was, she was fighting just getting over low self-esteem and anorexia bulimia. So I was like, anorexia bulimia? I didn't even know what bulimia was. I knew what anorexia was. She had to explain to me what bulimia was. And she told me that just... A year ago, before she came out to Yosemite with the Christian ministry, she used to regularly take a razor blade and cut. She would usually do it down here, she said, so that nobody could see the scars. She would cut herself, and, and she said that when the blood came out, she would know she's alive. <laughs> and I said to her, okay, I didn't say this out, you know, this, uh, let me tell you, uh, in my, my face, I was driving at the time, and I was going like, <laughs> inside I was going like, oh my goodness. Because <laughs> she was the first person I ever met who at least told me she was cutting herself. And it was really unusual back then. Right? But today, apparently, not so much. And um, I stayed really calm, because not trying not to freak out, and I said, I, I was about I'm 21 years old at this time. And I said to her, why would you cut yourself? And she looked at me and she said, because I think I'm a really bad and worthless person. And I deserve this. What do you say to that? What the heck do you say to that? Now, at that time, I didn't have enough Jesus in me. Uh, what I should have said to her was, that's not true. That's a lie from hell. Huh. It's not true. The biggest word there is, the truest word there is, the Bible says that's not true. Huh. I wish I could have said that back then. Today, that's probably what I'd say. Back then, I didn't know how to say that. Huh. We are having ostensibly serious conversations about giving firearms to teachers in case they ever find themselves in a situation where they must kill one of their students in order to protect the other ones. OK, this happened this week. In my neighborhood, I live in Cupertino. Cupertino, I, I live in the poor side of Cupertino, but it's rich. On the other side of Cupertino, on, on the other street is West San Jose. I know San Jose is supposed to be uh, poorer than Cupertino, but that side of San Jose is richer than my side of Cupertino. Um, my wife and I were coming back, and we saw these cops had 
um, you had bunched up. This is West San Jose Cupertino. And apparently they were chasing some person, and this person had skidded out and crashed in the side, jumped out of the car, and started running right, residential neighborhood, where the houses start at about $2 million. Jumped into this residential neighborhood. When I got home, there was an email. My daughter goes to the junior high not too far from that neighborhood. It's like one more over. And they said, oh, this, the elementary school close to that, that's Lawrence Expressway, they had, they locked in. No kids could go outside. But the middle school is far enough away that they said, we didn't have to do that. So they sent an email to every parent saying, we didn't have to do that, but the elementary school close to Lawrence Expressway had to do that. I was going, $2 million houses. <laughs> and immediately, the cops go, keep the kids inside. If you have to do this here in Silicon Valley, in a neighborhood where there are $2 million houses, where, where is there not? Where is it safe and nice in America? Hmm? Do you see the darkness? Am I making this up? Am I being dramatic? This word in the Bible, is it, is it true? It's true. Is it relevant? Oh my gosh, it's relevant. <laughs> um, he, he writes this thing. It is impossible for this, that's, he, he goes back to suicide, for it not to be personal. Eight of my wife's former classmates at one of the best public high schools in the wealthiest zip codes, in the wealthiest county in our state, have killed themselves. So she knows people, this is his wife, the guy who wrote this article. His wife personally knows people, went to wealthiest county, wealthiest high school, eight suicides. She knows those kids. You know what I was thinking? I was thinking, is, are we talking about Palo Alto? Are we talking about Santa Clara County? One of the richest counties, it's, we, we probably are the richest county in all of California. So I was thinking, is your wife from Santa Clara County? Are you, is your wife from here? When I read that, I was immediately was going like, maybe his wife is from here. These are your neighbors, brothers and sisters. If you don't cut yourself, I bet you you know somebody who does. And if you're not suicidal, I bet you you know somebody who does. Who is? And there's perfect weather. <laughs> Top schools. Hey, I thought if you just have everything, then you're supposed to be happy, right? Then why is the darkness so dark? Um, I'll give you one more quote. Um, this one is from a, a, a less famous writer. His name is um, Hudson Park. <laughs> <laughs> This is a quote, um, so uh, my, my son is a senior at Cupertino High. He's, uh, he's working his butt off on college applications. And so you guys know what that means, essays. And so if he works on essays, you know what that means. Dad is reading them too. <laughs> so it feels like I work a hard day as a pastor, and then I go home and go like, oh gosh, it's like senior year of high school all over again. <laughs> so when he's feeling the stress, I'm feeling it too. I'm going like, man, OK? But he, so he wrote this in, um, he wrote an essay about his experience going to the Native American Reservation out in Bishop. You guys, for those of you who are new to our church, our church every year um, goes on a mission trip to a Native American Reservation out in Bishop, California. And he wrote about that. And, um, but I want to, I want to quote from the, 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 the latter portion of what he wrote. This is what he wrote. He's not talking about Bishop. He's actually talking about where we live, Cupertino, Silicon Valley. But Bishop had kind of given him a different perspective on this place. This, he says, everyone seems so caught up. He's talking about Silicon Valley. 
Everyone seems so caught up chasing their own success that they live in much denial. His word. In Bishop, people know there's hurt. There's a lot of poverty and drug addiction. Every, almost literally every year we go there, like a kid dies. It's crazy. It's crazy. And you could just feel the sadness and hurt on the reservation when you walk around. It's crazy. In Bishop, people know there's hurt. But in Cupertino, everyone tends to ignore these serious issues. I mean, he listed some. School stress, constant performance pressure, social media anxiety, depression, and loneliness. When I read that, I was like, I was thinking, that seems like a pretty good summary of the darkness of our city. <laughs> he says, Silicon Valley may be richer, but it may be even more broken, an even more broken world than Bishop. Do you see the darkness? Let's go to part two. Um, there's a verse in here that I, I, I chewed on this week. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, verse 4. The rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. So for those of you who don't understand this passage, this is a reference. This is a reference back to the book of Judges. So during this period, um, Israel had conquered the land of Canaan, but they didn't fully conquer it. And then over time, they didn't have a leader, and they were falling away from God, and God had warned them, if you fall away from me, Oppressors will come, and they will murder you. They will take off away your, your women and children and enslave them, and they will oppress you. And this was, so it's a reference. For the yoke of his burden, the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken on the day of Midian. God, that is you, you, God, has broken. Midianites were horrendous. The Midianites were an evil people who treated the Israelites pretty much like garbage. Hmm? So, hey, we live in America. <laughs> we live in America, and we're the world's great superpower. Nobody's taken over our land. We live in freedom. I'm in control of my own life. I don't even need God. I don't even, even need a savior. This religion stuff seems rather irrelevant to me. The Bible seems very, very far away to me. And yet when I read this thing, the rod, I, I just looked at that, the rod of his oppressor. Israelites, they had an oppressor. And do you guys understand what the rod is? It's the stick that they used to beat you. <laughs> they beat you. The oppressor. And you just feel the injustice, you'd feel that you're made into less than a human being and you're beaten down like, like an animal or, or, or less. Right? The rod of the oppressor. You know, there are, you don't need some person to come into your life to beat you with the rod to have a rod of an oppressor. You know that? Do you have, an oppress Do you have something oppressing beating down your life? Is there a rod in your life? Bet you there is. And if there is no redeemer, there's nobody to look forward to, no light at the end of this darkness, well, no wonder people kill themselves. Live in a million-dollar neighborhood, and the answer is there's no, nobody to stop this rod from beating me. <laughs> Then, and this is all there is. There is no Christmas. There is no Advent. For many, many people in the city, do you understand? There is no, well, there's Christmas. There's like gifts. It's better than nothing. And I'm glad they have something to look forward to. But there is nobody to stop the rod of the oppressor. You hear that? There's a lot of people in our city like that. Um, I, I, I thought of like two that I bet you some of you would be very um, familiar with. Do you have the oppressor called performance? Hmm. At your job. 
Maybe it's your parents. I sure hope not. Maybe it's your spouse. If you don't perform up to this level, how can I love you? How can I honor you? How can I respect you? You have to perform. You have to be good enough. You have to be good enough. It's in the schools. My son gets it. 17-year-old kid. He gets it. Performance. That's an oppress. What if there was performance? Wake up every day. And there was no end. And what's the rod the performance demands? The rod, the stick, is fear. Fear of what? Failing. (laughs) If you fail the performance standard or the performance demand, and it gets higher and higher and higher, then you get hit with the rod of failure. And if you fail, then what are you? You're nothing. (laughs) We cast you out. You're not good enough. You're not good enough to go to this school. You're not good enough to work for our company. Your credit score is not good enough to get this mortgage. (laughs) Oh, you know, you're not doing good enough, so that's why our family isn't doing very well. And we're going to be poor, and we have to live in this cramped little apartment. Performance. And so we wake up every day, and the rod of the oppressor of performance is every day. Can I just stop for a moment? That's why we have Advent. We desperately need this season. (laughs) We desperately need this word. That in the midst of this darkness, there is a light. And that light is a person. And that person can break this rod and take away the oppression. Oh, you believe that? Can you believe that? One more, oppressor. Um, The perfect house and the perfect family with the perfect kids. How about that one? You ever watch these shows? My wife and I watch these shows. uh, uh, Property Brothers, (laughs) Love It or List It. My wife likes those two shows, right? Property Brothers, Love It or List It. Every time I watch the show, I'm sitting there going, I'm sinning and breaking the 10th commandment. (laughs) You shall not covet your neighbor's house. I'm sitting there going like, my house sucks compared to that house. (laughs) I was like, open concept kitchen, totally cool. All right, we don't have that. (laughs) I just want a garage. These people get a garage. We don't have a garage. Just, Just a garage. We could put all our crap in the garage. We don't have that, okay? So I'm just coveting that. But, you know, in America, these shows are so popular. And, but you notice the house doesn't just represent a beautiful house. It represents happiness with the kids, the place where the kids will play, and the view that they will have. It's a vision of a whole heavenly, perfect little life. And in this city, oh my goodness, If you want even that, it could be oppressive. What if you don't get it? What if you don't get it? Will it be okay? Or will you have a rod that beats you on the top of your head or in your heart? Oh, you're going to live in this apartment for the rest of your life. (laughs) You're going to rent this house, and you're never going to live in a house like that. (laughs) You know, you know what my, my wife and I tell our kids? The, the other show that's a really, what's the one called where the, it's a Christian couple? You know, Fixer Upper. Okay. They, they, get, they, they buy a house for $100,000, and then they get another $120,000 to fix it up. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so they buy a house, which I think is a nicer house than our house, for $100,000. And then they get another $120,000 to fix, her up, fix it up. And my kids go, I want to live in a house like that. And I go, It's an awesome house, isn't it? But then you have to move to Waco, Texas. (laughs) You want to live in Waco? They go, no. Here you go. But the other side of it is this. You have an oppressor, the worldly happiness oppressor. 
There's some perfect little standard. If we don't give this to our kids, how will they ever be happy? As a father, you're like, if I don't give this to my kids, then maybe I'm not a good father. As a mother, you're like, if I don't give this to my kids, then we failed as parents. And so the failure rod is hitting you. And the oppressing rod is there. You wake up every day dealing with that? Hmm. You probably do. Hey, I am a professional Christian. (laughs) And I feel that one. I feel it when I'm watching the show. (laughs) And I like the show. (laughs) And so it's not like I want to turn it off, but I feel it. But today, can I offer you some good news? There's light. Stop. There's a light. You're not in this. Step out of the darkness and let the Redeemer break that rod. Just break it. Whatever He has for you, it's more. It's more. You know, we have brothers and sisters around the world, they live in mud huts. Do you know that in the history of Christianity, some people had to flee and, 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 and flee their lives and be inside the catacombs? You guys know what catacombs are? It's where they bury the dead into the city. And they had Jesus in the catacombs. I have a dumpy house in a $2 million neighborhood, okay? It's okay. It's like, I, I think I can learn to have Jesus and let the rod be broken. But it takes faith. In this advent, in this word. Can you believe in that? Let me close with this. Um, you know, I, I love uh, Pastor Young. He, he said that this is his favorite time of the year. If he lived on the East Coast, I'm not sure he'd say that. <laughs> When I lived on the East Coast, I, I would never have said, December, my favorite time of the year. It is cold. I grew up here. I was like, no, this time of the year. Except for Christmas, it really sucks. I hate it, right? Um, that's how I felt when I lived in uh, Boston, especially. Boston is miserable, right? Um, but, you know, Christmas, it is a beautiful time of the year. Uh, do you know that even... The people, they know Jesus is there. It's like Jesus' shadow is cast all over. They know he's back there. (laughs) They know Christmas is a Christian. These Christians, these whacked Christians, they invented this holiday. And they know it's about this Jesus guy. And they know the whole story. The manger, the shepherds, the wise men. You know, they know that all the churches are going to have these cute little kids dressing up at the shepherds, and they they know it, okay? They know it. And they know that these are all Christmas, that they're going to hear Christmas songs. And you know what? You go down to the mall, and you will hear all of them. (laughs) They're just going to put it on Pandora or Apple Music or whatever, and you're going to hear all the songs, And you know what? I love all of them, including the non-Jesus ones, the secular ones. I I even like those because people are going to hear the secular Christmas song, and you know what they're going to think about? Jesus. (laughs) They can't help it. They're going to think about Jesus. Um, I I watched a documentary a few years ago. Uh, It was all about the song White Christmas. You guys know that song? So it starts like this. I won't sing it, okay? I'm dreaming, can you hear Bing Crosby? Of a white Christmas. It's the most famous version. The original singer was Bing Crosby. And so I was learning about the history of the song. You know who wrote the song? A Jewish guy named Irving Berlin wrote the song. Brilliant. One of the most brilliant composers, American composers of the 20th century, and he's Jewish. So his family doesn't celebrate Christmas because you're not so... They were religiously Jewish. But apparently, according to the documentary, when he was young, he loved Christmas. (laughs) He couldn't help it. He would go to his friend's house, see the tree, (laughs) see the gifts, 
and there'd be Santa, <laughs> and they'd have the music, and there'd be so much joy, and, they, and they'd have peace on earth, joy to the world, goodwill toward men. And he said, this is not my holiday. <laughs> He's like, just think about that. So then oh, we'll go do Hanukkah. And have you noticed that you know, the Jews tried to make Hanukkah more and more like Christmas? Although it was, it was never intended to be like Christmas. And he wrote this song. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. And if you listen to the song, it sounds like a hymn. It sounds like a hymn. And you know who, why the song was a hit? He, it, was, it, was a, it was written, and then the, the soldiers in World War II would hear it. And they would be in Europe. And they'd have firsthand the rod of the oppressor, except the rod of the oppressor was like Nazi gunfighting. <laughs> the rod of the oppressor was like Nazi, Nazi machine guns. And they were saying, and they would free Jews being gassed. And it would be in the dead of winter, and they are thousands of miles away, and their friends had just been blown up and murdered. And then they heard the song on the radio, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. And the soldiers would sit there, and they just start bawling. <laughs> they just start bawling. No mention of Jesus, but he's there. Oh, he's there. I love all these songs. Hmm. I, I've said to you that um, this is the time of the year. Um, I love it because all these secular, unbelieving, you know, music artists sing the praises of Jesus. They all got to have a Christmas album because it, it, all, it all makes money. <laughs> right? they all, it's crazy. Like, you know, anybody can come out with a Christmas album in itself. It's crazy, right? Do you know Erasure? The, the big band from the 80s and 90s, and you know, they're very, very obviously gay. They, have a, they came out with a Christmas album a few years ago. It's pretty darn good. <laughs> I listened to it on Spotify. And even there, and it was, they didn't sing the non-Jesus songs. There they are, O Come All Ye Faithful, sang by Erasure. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> there they are. Joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye, to Advent. Let me close by um, saying a little something about these, these verses. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Shalom. Hmm. Let's say a little something about each one of those. You all want counselors in your life? I mean, I'm not talking about a therapist. A counselor is just somebody who gives you counsel, advice, wisdom. I sure hope, don't you all want someone who gives you wonderful wisdom? <laughs> the wonderful wisdom giver. If you have one or two people in your life who can give you any real wisdom, you know that person's precious but you have somebody in your life who's like that, the wonderful wisdom giver. <laughs> He's mighty God. <laughs> the rod of your oppressor, he just breaks it. I'm bigger than that. I'm bigger than that. This is Jesus. He's bigger than the rod. This one's interesting. Everlasting Father. Okay, when I first read this, I was like, this is confusing because Jesus is the Son of God and God is the Father. But in this verse, this is, okay, I want you to understand, this is not a confusion. The writer of Isaiah, did, like, he didn't, he's not screwing up the doctrine of the Trinity here, okay? He's calling the newborn king, the coming Messiah, the Son and everlasting Father. How about this? You know what he's saying? Don't you wish you had a leader? And he treated you like a father. Hmm. Don't you wish you had a boss? He didn't just kick you around. He treated you like a father. Don't you wish we had a president who was fatherly to everybody? We don't. 
which is why everybody's so angry. And yet, this king came to be a father to us. Why? So he can show us, my father is like this. And let me close with Prince of Peace. That's the word we use, peace. It's a good word, right? But it's not nearly good enough. In the Hebrew, the word is shalom. Peace, generally, we tend to think peace means like this. I'm against you, or you don't like me, and let's make up. Now we have peace. That's not what shalom means. It's not what it means. Shalom means this. We show up, and we have lack. We have wounds. We have longing. And shalom fills it all up. All the wounds. All the lack. All the longing. The Bible has this picture that my cup runs over. You have a cup, and it's empty, and you're thirsty, and you need a drink. And if you can't drink, then you will die. (laughs) Right? You know what shalom is? It's the cup is so full, it's running over. You have no lack. You have complete wholeness. He's the prince of shalom. You know, this Jesus... He came. He didn't come with might like this, like mighty, but he didn't come that way. You know the mighty way he came? He came lowly. He came weak for the weak. He came poor. Oh, was he poor? You ever think about this? His first bed was a manger. A manger is the worst first bed of all time. (laughs) Because a manger is a feeding trough for an animal. This is the wonderful counselor's bed. This is the Prince of Peace. He came that way in Christmas. So then on Good Friday, he could atone for all our worst lack, our shame, our guilt, our wickedness. And then on Easter, he gave us what he came to give us, the biggest light there is. Death will end. Sin will end. There'll be no more injustice. There'll be no more oppressors. There'll be no more rod to whack you, to fear you, to sting you. Let's celebrate Christmas. Let's pray.